Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to the 17th issue of Chewbacca Chats. We're really glad to have you with us. And uh, we're also glad to have Carl Little uh, along for the ride. Carl is, a, uh, is, is, an, is the author of an article in the 2018 issue of Chewbacca, Marguerite Yersenar, Perinacy at Petite Plaisance. Uh, Madame Yersenar was the first woman to be admitted to the French Academy since it had been founded by Cardinal Richelieu in 1635. And as for Carl, born in New York City, he holds a master's degree in French from Middlebury College. He is the author of many art books. He co authored with his brother David, The Art of Acadia in 2016. He's been a resident of Mount Desert Island since 1989. And he is currently the communications manager at Maine Community Foundation. So, Carl, welcome to the program. Bonjour, Tim. <laughs> to try and use my master's in French. Uh, oh, okay. thank you. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's it's it's, it's a it's fun to be here and uh, glad to be able to talk about Madame Yersenar and Piranesi, two of my favorite. We're really glad. To, we're really glad people. to have you. And uh, I want to start the uh, uh, some of our some of our background slides. Everybody gets a real quick preview. Whoa. And uh, let's see, I'll turn on uh, closed captions. And uh, let's, let's, get, um, let's get started. So why don't you begin by reading a section of your article to us? Sure, and uh, just to uh, situate people, this is the living room of Petit Plaisance, uh, the former home of Margaret Yersenar and Grace Frick in Northeast Harbor. And so my, the little section I'm gonna read from the article uh, is, about, is about that house. Mount Desert Island would become Yersenar's refuge, her home base, to which she would over the years return from her extensive travels. While she didn't attach, quote, a great deal of importance to the house itself, unquote, it served, she said, as an asylum, a cell for self-knowledge, as St. Catherine of Siena might have said. Petite Plaisance would prove to be the perfect place for writing. Yersenar completed two of her most acclaimed books, Memoirs of Hadrian and The Abyss, while in residence, and many of her other works were composed and or edited there. In her notes, she wrote about the creation of Memoirs of Hadrian. She recalled how on December 26, 1950, quote, on an evening of freezing cold and in the almost polar silence of Mount Desert Island off the Atlantic shore, she strived, quote, to live again through the smothering heat of a day in July in the year 138 in Bailly, to feel the weight of this, to feel the weight of a sheet on weary, heavy limbs, and to catch the barely perceptible sound of that of that tideless sea as from time to time it reached a man whose whole attention was concentrated upon other murmurs, those of his approaching death. I tried to go as far as the last sip of water, the last spasm of pain, the last image in his mind. Now the emperor had but to die. Wow. And I, I just love the contrast between that freezing cold <laughs> MDI night, and then she's writing about this Emperor Hadrian on his deathbed in the year 138 in the heat of Tivoli in July. Uh, it, it's, quite, it's quite wonderful. And she seems to have possessed her subjects, or maybe the other way around. Yes, she, she really did. She, she, uh, she became Emperor Hadrian. I mean, it's in, the, I believe the book is in, for, in the first person, so she, she really it's almost like a body change kind of thing. And, and when you first arrived at, uh, in Somesville, I think in 1989, or very soon after, you wrote a review for the newsletter of the Somesville Library and the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. The, the, the newsletter was called Betwixt the Hills. Yeah, and actually, I, 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 don't, know, I, can, I don't know if people can see it, but I actually have a copy of it here. It was just a little four page, kind of, you know, notes about upcoming events and things like that. And uh, I had moved to that 
first house on the left on Oak Hill Road in 1989 with my family and, and was just immediately attracted to the little Soames Field Library, which was just, you know, like 100 yards away. And the first year or so that I was living there, I had, took care of the, the two kids and I, I would walk Emily up to the Montessori school at the parish house and then I would take James over to the little, uh, yeah, James to the library. Uh, so I ended up spending a lot of time at that library and became good friends with Patricia Pugh, Pat Pugh, who was the librarian at that time. And she uh, was responsible for the newsletter. And I said, well, I, you know, I'd be glad to help out a little bit with it. So um, I worked on three or four issues, you know, over two years or so until I got, was gainfully employed again. Uh, but it was a fun little uh, thing. And, and, and it, it was the way that I got to know uh, your sonar uh, as a writer, uh, reading Memoirs of Hadrian, a, a really amazing book. Uh, did you read it in French or in English? Do you remember? I, I, I read it in English. Yeah. yeah. My, French, my French is good, but uh, uh, you know, it's a very deep and I, I was I, not, not thick, I mean, but, but a very heavy, the, the, the writing is very, very dense, shall we say. Yep. Uh, I, I wrote it. Too. Yes. I mean, yes. You don't want to scare readers off. They're, uh, yeah. And, and she's yeah. Uh, absolutely renowned by the Francophone world for the wisdom found, such as a statement like the one we're showing here. Yeah. Just read that out loud for us. Yeah, actually, I was good. I have the full quote here. Oh, good. Actually, okay. Uh, uh, he, she wrote, um, um, but experience shows that in spite of our infinite care in choosing our successors, the mediocre emperors will always outnumber the wise and at least one fool will reign per century. And you have to remember that I was writing this in 1989. So it was sort of in between Reagan and Bush one. Yeah, yeah, Reagan and Bush one. And I wasn't you know, exactly pointing to either one of them, but uh, it certainly is true that uh, that happens. Mediocre well, and it, it, bad presence. This is this is one of these statements that maybe uh, if the shoe fits, uh, <laughs> you can you <laughs> yeah. can wear it. You can decide who this might apply to. Yeah, exactly. Um, and um, th there was more uh, to your Somesville immersion, uh, the Brookside Cemetery. In your article, you say that uh, the burial place of Madame Yersenar took on a special meaning for, for you. And so tell us about your, that experience. Well, the house we lived in, uh, which is now uh, where, where Hank Schmelzer and, and Cynthia Livingston live, backs on Brookside Cemetery. And so I got to know a little bit about Madame Yersenar and realized that she was buried there with, alongside her translator and partner, Grace Frick. And so we, just in our adventures with the kids, the kids were quite small at that time. We, we would go back into the, into the cemetery and, and uh, sometimes bike, take our bikes over there. We actually took our grandkids there this summer. You know, it's sort of a one, it's such an idyllic spot, you know, with a wonderful- Good, good place to learn how to ride a bike. It is, it's perfect, yeah. As long as you don't run into a tombstone. <laughs> um, but uh, I did want to read the uh, what that the 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 lines on her tombstone are from uh, her book The Abyss, and they translate it as "May it please the one who perchance is to expand the human heart to life's full measure." I think it's really beautiful. Uh, but it's there, and it's you know it's a place of pilgrimage. Uh, people come from abroad, from France, from Canada. Uh, she was beloved in Canada. Uh, and, and, you know, I remember when we first lived uh, in Soamsville, the people would ask for directions to, to, her, to her, uh, her final resting place. So it well, was, we get that all the time at the Soamsville Museum. You know, yeah, friends, I bet you do. People. Yeah. Yeah. And what, what, what accounts for her renown? Well, it's really based on her novels and her writings. Uh, you know, the memoirs of Hadrian was a, was a, you know, an incredible success. And then, you know, she subsequently was inducted into the Academie Francaise uh, as the first woman since the Academy was founded by Cardinal Richelieu. 
in whatever it was, 1639 or something. Um, so she, she had this great, and she had just, just this incredible presence. Um, uh, and I mean, she was a celebrity writer in, in many ways. I mean, I didn't realize um, how much the media came to her in Northeast Harbor. I mean, she had people coming, you know, TV people and interviewers and writers, and uh, it's, it's pretty impressive. Next slide. I, I want to invite our, reader, our listeners to uh, chime in with questions. You can ask us questions uh, through the Facebook Live comments section or in the Q&A uh, section if you're watching us on Zoom. And uh, we'll, we hope to have time to take up questions at the end. Great. So uh, how did the world-renowned novelist Marguerite Yourcenar come to live in Northeast Harbor for much of her life? Well, it's kind of a wonderful story. Um, she was living in, she was in Paris, visiting Paris, and she was in this hotel, and in the same hotel, Grace Frick was staying, and they met up in the bar uh, and started talking and basically fell in love. Uh, this was in 1937. And then they went off traveling together. They went to Sicily and other, other places, and then uh, Marguerite, decided to move to Hartford, Connecticut uh, to live with, with Grace Frick uh, and they settled there. And then in the summer, Hartford, you know, as a city hot, you know, to escape the city, they started coming up to Mount Desert Island. And they first stayed at a little cabin right there on Brookside Road, right by the cemetery. Uh, they had a wonder, wonderful little spot there. Uh, and then started looking around for a house and found Petit Plaisance uh, and bought that, I think it was in 1952. Uh, and that became her permanent re residence till she died in 1987. So uh, it, it is quite remarkable. I mean, she, it, it became her base of operations. Um, uh, and then apropos this painting, uh, when, it, when she was inducted into the French Academy, every inductee is memorialized with a formal portrait and fortunate for Madame Yersinar, she didn't have far to go because uh, Richard Estes, the phenomenal realist painter, lived across the harbor from her, more or less. And so she, she, uh, Richard was commissioned to do her portrait. Uh, this is in her, her uh, studio in the house. Uh, that that desk that she's standing behind was built by a local carpenter here on the island sometime in the 50s. I'd love to find out who that was. And the setup of that, of that desk, she would work opposite Grace Frick, who was her translator. So they would sit there together face to face and work during the day. And I, I love this portrait, uh, the, the, the light, the, sh the shadow of Madame Yersen or against the wall. But, uh, and then I, of course, I, I really relate to the messy desk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the messy desk club. And now, uh, Carl, you're always, you're always introducing me to fascinating characters that I personally am un have never heard of, uh, including right. uh, Giovanni Piranesi. So tell us about him and the connection between Madame Yersenar and uh, Piranesi. Well, I first came across Piranesi's work uh, when I worked for a prints and drawings dealer in New York named Lucian Goldschmidt. And we always had a, some of his prints in stock and I always remember uh, the, the writer Susan Sontag coming in to look at them. She was a great Piranesi fan. And just like Madame Yersenar had them all over her apartment in New York. Uh, it's one of her favorite, uh, favorite artists also. Uh, but uh, Yersenar has said that she was first introduced to Piranesi when she was 20. She was visiting the uh, Hadrian's Villa in Tivoli and just became enraptured by that place and that, and that emperor. Uh, but also then came to discover that Piranesi had painted the, the, villa, the villa Adriana many times and so began to collect, uh, later on, collect his prints and, and specifically images of, of, the, of Hadrian's villa. I think the collection at Petit Plaisance, almost every one of them is connected somehow to Hadrian's villa. Uh, so that was, a, that was the beginning of her her exploration of Piranesi, and then she went on to write about him. Um, she was 
really, you know, fascinated by the ruins. He was, he was just a, the, 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 the great artist of, of Roman ruins. Um, and it looks like uh, you have a, a Piranesi hanging on the wall behind you. <laughs> yes, I do. And that's courtesy of the Mount Desert Island Historical Society. This was a piece that was reproduced for the show uh, that accompanied uh, the, the, that, that edition of Chibaco in 2018. And, yes. Yeah. And what do you think it, what are the qualities of a Piranesi that so fascinated your sonar and S Susan Sontag and perhaps yourself? I mean, what, it, what is it about these uh, images that you find so compelling? Well, I mean, there's just, you know, you think about the rise and fall of the Roman, Roman Empire. This is, this is the other side. This is the fall, you know, years on where, you know, you, 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 could, still, you could still walk through these ruins in Piranesi's time and be surrounded. I mean, they're, they're, they're haunted, these images, uh, but they're also just incredibly beautifully rendered, uh, you know, from the architecture to all of the, the, the foliage and the trees that are growing inside and the, and then these sort of uh, random figures, uh, some of them visitors, some of them beggars uh, that, that populated this, the, the, the spaces. And I think, uh, I, I like to think that uh, uh, your, your sonar was, you know, felt, you know, was, 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 was felt connected to this, to this, to the, to the ambiance and the atmosphere and, and was, and, and that really was what, what uh, connected her to them, yeah. But she was also, had her feet on the ground here in Mount Desert Island. She had relationships with island residents. Can you tell us some anecdotes of what that looked like? Yeah, well, not long after moving here, I, I started to hear these stories about her. And one of my favorites was, um, I, think, I think her name was Kathy Sprague. She worked at the Mount Desert Island Post Office with, with Lisa Hamer, Lisa, Lisa, uh, uh, Linda Hamer, Linda Savage. And Kathy, uh, we were talking one day at the post office about Madame Yersenar. I can't remember how it came up, but she said that she remembered that when they first lived, uh, stayed on the island, they, they loved to ride horses. And in the winter, they would send up through the mail these great boxes of oats for the horses that they had ridden. I thought, but that's such a wonderful, you know, I mean, it's just sort of, I mean, Madame Yersenor loved, loved animals. But as you can see from this photo, she, she was, she, she, she was out and about. Um, there are a lot of stories of her interacting with, with uh, townspeople. She was not the recluse that, that a lot of people made her out to be. It was a lot of, a lot of connections. Uh, uh, and there's some really poignant moments in, in her biography, the biography by, Samuel, that uh, describe her her interactions with 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 local with villagers. You know how they came when when Grace Frick was dying, for example. How people came and brought a you know a dinner or flowers or whatever and tried to console her. And uh, uh, yeah. so that it, it, it was wonderful, a wonderful yeah. relationship. That's lovely. Now um, for the for the first time in. Uh, 32 years as a house museum, Petite Plaisance will be closed, is closed for tours this year uh, yeah. because of COVID-19. But um, one of the things we've done with our uh, Zoom announcement and also on Facebook Live is we've provided a link to a virtual house tour of Petite Plaisance from their website in, in French and in English. But Carl, why don't you, why don't you take us on uh, a tour of some of your favorite places in Petite Plaisance? Should I? Sure, and, and this, this is the house itself, and, and uh, it's, it's actually undergoing renovations this summer, this year. Uh, and, and so there, I, I can't show you pictures, but if you, if you take the virtual tour, uh, and actually if you go to the website, there's a, a section, Quoi de Neuf, What's New? Uh, there are some photographs of the work that's underway to shore up the house, uh, but the, this is the entrance um, as, as as it looks today. And then next slide. But, but tell us where is it located for people oh. who you know maybe lived here for many years but never laid eyes on it. Uh, I, well, it's it's uh, what, what is that road uh, in the back of Northeast Harbor? 
spot. Uh, Josh, I'm stumped too. Is it C Street or? Yeah, maybe it's C Street. Some, yeah. if, if we're wrong, somebody will tell us in the comments. Right. Hopefully they will. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, it's right there just off the, 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 the behind the village. Uh, it's right next to the old uh, Northeast Harbor Library. It's immediately next door to that. Okay. There yeah. you go. And then it's not far from, I mean, I think you could get to Clifton Dock or you could get to the water pretty easily from there. Um, and this is the uh, the parlor. Uh, and one thing of note, and I'm, I'm taking some of these ideas, some of these thoughts from, from Joan Howard's virtual tour of the house, which I recommend to everybody. It's really wonderful. Uh, but one of the things to note is are the Delft tiles behind the, the wood stove there. Uh, she, uh, Madam Yersner, was brought up, she was born in Brussels, Belgium, and uh, lived in a, in a chateau, in a tower of a chateau, and apparently had Delft tiles in her room. And so when she moved into Petite Plaisance, she, 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 she brought those with her. And uh, it's, uh, I, thank you, Charles, uh, 35 South Shore Road is the exact address, <laughs> Petite Plaisance. Um, Appreciate that. Yep. And then the next slide, um, and then you can see the Pyrenees in there too. Yeah. And then this is the kitchen, which is just wonderful. And, and one of the wonderful quirks about it is that Madame Yersenar could not stand the idea of having the refrigerator in the room. So it's behind one of those doors. And I, I, it might be the one on the right. Um, I, I just love that idea of hiding away the, uh, uh, hiding away the refrigerator. Uh, and she was she was primarily vegetarian apparently, and she did the cooking. Again, something that I learned from the virtual tour. And one one of the things that the, uh, the the virtual tour points out to you is that this pottery is from that wonderful potter in Blue Hill. Yes. Uh, what is that? Um, Somebody else would tell us that too. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's um, oh shoot, uh, Frank Amabi, who is a painter and graphic artist uh, did work with them. It's, 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 it's very well known. I'm just drawing a blank. Uh, but yeah, it, it, and she, I think she really liked to, to use local, uh, you know, get local work and, and uh, as much as she can. This is a, a lampshade decorated with, uh, decorated by, in hand by Margaret Yersenar with uh, expressions in Greek and Latin that are related to Adrian's reign. Uh, again, just sort of a wonderfully quirky uh, object in the house. And I think you just get the sense of this beauty. And if you love books, there are books oh. everywhere. Oh, it's a wonderful, dream. Wonderful yeah. books. Yeah, one of the things that, that Joan Howard mentions in her tour is that she, apparently like a couple of years before Madame Yersenar died, she started making notes about everything in the house. Uh, she, she called it objects that objects in Northeast Harbor. And I would love to see that because I imagine that she may have mentioned the Pyrenees prints and, uh, uh, and, and maybe yeah. written, said something about them. I'd love to see that at some point. Now here's a, a gathering. Yes, and I had to do some little research on that, but uh, uh, this is a photograph, um, July 1985, and left to right, that's Joan Howard, who's the director of Petit Plaisance, and Madame Yersenar, and a man named Gautam Dasgupta. Uh, and Dasgupta was, das, Dasgupta was the, an editor of the Performing Arts Journal. And that year, the Performing Arts Journal published four of Madame Yersenor's plays in translation. So he was visiting, visiting Madame Yersenor uh, at Petit Plaisance. And you can see uh, Madame Yersenor's toy poodle below the table there. Uh, Fuku, I think, is her was her name. Uh, anyway, kind of and nice. uh, and then finally, uh, this is the wood garden behind the house uh, with a Japanese lantern that uh, Madame Yersenar liked to light at night, and, and it's a, sort of a place for meditation. And I, I think you're when when the when the building when the house is open, you're allowed to go back there and and, and, and check it out. And I've this never is been a place, back there myself. This, this is a place that the virtual tour describes as uh, you know, a place for her to, to meditate and all sort of a spiritual exercise. It says that when she concluded Memoirs of Hadrian, 
she, or maybe it was the abyss, she repeated the, abyss. the character's name 300 times. Yes, Zeno. Zeno. Yeah, in order to sort of bring him back and also say farewell to him. I mean, it was something that she said she did right after finishing the book. And then again on the virtual tour, Joan Howard relates how years later, uh, a Mexican visitor came and went back to the same spot and repeated Yursinar's name some, something like 200 times in a row in, in a similar act of trying to, to, to thank her and to remember her. And uh, so it has a special, special quality, that place. Well, um, let's, we're going to wrap up your section. I think we do have a few uh, questions to field, but sure, Carl, why don't you uh, bring this your uh, discussion of this to a close? Yes. Well, I this is a photo I took of the of the sign in winter uh, in one of our winter walks in Northeast Harbor. But I I wanted to end with a short poem by Hortense Flexner. Uh, she was a poet that uh, Madame Yersenar befriended. Uh, on the island. Uh, she lived on Sutton Island in the summer, and she wrote some incredible poems about the area. And so I thought everybody could relate to this one. It's called The Island. This multiple isle peeled to its granite at the waterline, descending now by inches to the sea, marked for possession by the ruin of salt, still holds its own. And still to its sides we cling to summer's rarity, strengthen our homes of matchsticks with our love, replace the spongy plank, the loosening nail, and plan return, savoring the end. An end, no end. Farewell, not going. For we have learned as creatures of the woods to be most still, unseen to see, in the deep silence here, until our lives, inhaling sea and freshness as our one with seabirds nesting near the waves. Ants among ground pine, red squirrels eating cones in an old porch chair. And we are numbered with the seasonal tribes that sleep or flee or die, but will return. Beautiful. Hortense Flexner. And I worked on an edition of those Sutton Island poems with Linda Lewis at Port in a Storm. We published a small edition of, of poems from Set. Sutton Island, and uh, I want to show the cover because it's by Holly Cote, who's a wonderful artist, woodblock printer, that lived who lived in Sonesville, uh, passed away a few years ago. Well, Carl, we have people helping us out. Uh, Tom okay. Hayward reminds us that we were looking for Rowan Tree pottery. Oh, thank you. I knew yeah. it started with an R. Thanks, Tom. And uh, a question from someone we don't have the name. Can you tell us a little of Marguerite's early life during and between the First and Second World Wars? Yeah, I would go to the I, I would go to her biography. Um, I'm going to hold it up here. Uh, it is really very extensive. It's uh, jo Josiane Savigno uh, and give Joan Howard. Long, give us a good long look at that. Maybe yeah. Okay. Like it's uh, called Marguerite Yerson or in Inventing a Life. And it's, it's yay big, and uh, I've gotten so much out of it. Um, you also would want to read um, We Met in Paris, which is Joan Howard's new book that came out last year. Uh, that also has a lot about their lives, uh, Grace Fricks and Margaret Yersenar's lives on Mount Desert Island. I mean, as well as the, the early years, but it really focuses more from 1937 when, when they met to, uh, to, when, to when Grace died. Well, but I, time, I would recommend go, going to the biography for that. Very good. In the time we have left, Carl, which is not much, yep. uh, some, uh, some sh if short answers to questions. Was um, Jad, Jad Roberts asked, would, was her induction in the Academy Francaise greater than an honorarium? Isn't the Academy charged with protecting the purity of the French language? If so, did Madame Yershinar become involved in that effort? Oh, that's a great question. And I think that there was some, some controversy around her induction because she was living in America. Uh, you know, she was, uh, she became, a, I think she became an American citizen in 1942, I believe. Um, so, and, 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 you know, people, you know, 
put that made that made made that argument that she was not a you know you know living in France so to speak so um, but it, it 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 was a big deal uh, and I, I I noted in um, in the essay that uh, the news was so big of her induction that it actually took over the headlines this is right around the time I think of the Iran uh, hostage situation and actually kind of knock that off the screen for a couple of days. Uh, so it was, it was really a major, major deal. And uh, Ron Epp, who knows his way around in archives. Asks, oh, he does. Could you explain the steps your sonar took between making her initial list of house objects and the availability of the house to visitors today? Did, did her, I, the way I get that is, did her starting to, catalog the objects in her house was that a first step towards making this a, a museum yeah that's a, that's also a good question I, I don't know the answer to that but i imagine it is i imagine that uh, uh when did she say i think she was i think joan said that it was she started it about three years before she died so she may have had a sense that you know already plans were in place um and then the, and then the establishment of the trust uh in, in her will that the that the house would remain exactly as it was. I think this was her way of sort of saying, okay, this is what's in here for future, future uh, researchers. This is exactly where things are and what they are and where they came from. Uh, and so it was sort of an inventory of a life. And we're, we're very glad she did and that Joan Howard and others uh, involved with Petit Plaisance continue to make this space available to us. Carl, uh, our time has disappeared. I want to thank you for, <laughs> for joining us. Uh, sure, thank this you was for really having wonderful, me. As, as always, to, to spend time with you. I, I really appreciate it. And uh, I want to invite our audience back next week when uh, we will feature art historian and curator Jane Bianco, who will talk about the work of photographer Elliot Porter. Uh, Elliot Porter's work is currently <clears throat> on exhibit at the Farnsworth Art Museum. Uh, it, the exhi exhibition is titled All the Wild Places, and Jane curated that uh, exhibition. So I hope you can join us for that. Thanks for joining us this time. I uh, want to wish you all well in these beautiful summer days. I hope you're also <coughs> wearing a mask, washing your hands, and uh, in all other ways, staying safe. Absolutely. So uh, take care, everyone. Carl, again, once again, thanks very much. You bet. Thanks, Tim. Take care, everybody.